now. So welcome to the long-term care division. Just wanna stress that we're gonna call this um, meeting to order, but it is only informational. So we're not gonna um, take any action or formal action today. And we are gathered here to hear the language in a technical bill. And I'll provide a little context and we have a list of testifiers. So it's great to see everybody. Um, as you know, in uh, 2019, we passed legislation to start licensing assisted living facilities. Minnesota was the only state that did not license um, assisted living facilities. And the language we're gonna hear about today is technical language that we need um, to help smooth the transition to assisted living licensure, which is, will be implemented in August of 2021. I just wanna note that um, we have an agreement from Senator Housley to carry this legislation in the Senate. And um, when we introduce the bill formally, there will also be an appropriation for the Board of Executives for long-term services and supports. And that bill was heard in HHS finance informational hearing on Monday. And it uses special revenues raised by the board through fees to help them prepare for this transition to licensure. Also in your packet that was sent out um, from Chris McCall is a joint letter. It's in the hearing materials from stakeholders who support this legislation. This included providers, consumer advocates, the Minnesota Department of Health and multiple ombudsman's offices. And we're gonna hear some of those organizations today. Uh, a lot of work went into House File 90, the Assisted Living Licensure Bill. Hundreds of hours of work group meetings of all the advocates. And they've been working on this technical bill for a long time as well. So I want to thank everyone who's put so much time and effort, MDH, all of our stakeholders, um, all of our consumer advocates and providers into working to get to agreement on this technical language, which will really help facilitate and I think make the lives of MDH easier as they progress through rulemaking next year. So thank you, everyone. Also in your packet is a summary document of the proposal. This was a, a document created by the Minnesota Department of Health and it'll help you walk through this technical language as MDH um, goes through their presentation. Okay, so today, uh, ever, hopefully you've had time to read it. Um, we're gonna take testifiers and then after each testifier, um, I'm happy to open it up for questions for each testifier and then we'll take questions and answers at the end as well. So our first testifier today is from the Minnesota Department of Health and I believe it's Diane Rydrich, is she on? And I think she might be on a phone line. So Diane, if you wanna I, unmute yourself and start presenting. Great, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thanks for having us here today. Um, my name is Diane Rydrich and I'm the Acting Assistant Commissioner of the Health Systems Bureau at the Department of Health. And first of all, I would just like to echo Chair Schultz's thanks to the really wide group of stakeholders who've worked with us on this consensus transition language. A number of them are here today and you will hear directly from some of them and all of them um, expressed their, um, their feelings about this language and the urgency of it in the letter that Chair Schultz referenced. Um, you all know that the passage of assisted living licensure language in 2019 was really groundbreaking. It involved many, 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 many hours of discussion and debate and different versions and give and take among a wide group of consumer advocates, providers, and regulators. And there was strong bipartisan leadership um, in the legislature. The, I think it was really, as, as difficult as it was, it was an expression of a, a shared commitment to developing a path towards a single license for assisted living that really balances consumer protections with a system that is workable both for providers and regulators. Um, what we're here today to discuss is transition language that was again developed through a consultative process involving those same organizations that worked together in 2019. Um, their willingness to engage with us in this process and to identify points of agreement and compromise across, again, many hours of meetings has been critical and we really, really appreciate their support for this. Um, I won't spend too much time on the background because I think Chair Schultz um, offered uh, some good context for it. But as you know, the, the, the basic 
um, principle. The basic goal of the 2019 law was to shift from a two requirement system where we have housing with services registration and then um, a separate process for licensing um, home care providers who provide assisted living services. It moves to a, a unified model. Um, under the new law, each assisted living facility will have one uh, integrated license that combines both the assisted living residents housing and their services and housing with services and home care um, regulations will be replaced with the new assisted living regulations um, that came out of, of that law in 2019 and out of the rules that we are working on right now. The law requires us to begin issuing that unified license to assisted living facilities starting on August 1st of 2021. And we've been working towards that implementation date for more than a year now, um, and now really staring it in the face and, and now being just uh, seven months away from it. So anytime there is a, a large complex new law like this one, sometimes we discover technical issues when we get more deeply into the implementation process that need to be addressed. Maybe it was something that um, might have been an oversight at the time. Um, it could be a situation where the environment has changed since then and something needs to be updated, or it could just be something that seems sufficiently clear at the time the law was passed. But as we then moved into trying to interpret it to implement the law, we discovered that it needs additional clarification. So what you will see in the bill in front of you today is a number of technical changes to address some of those issues that we felt um, as we have moved forward in this process needed to be clarified. It also includes some transition language that explicitly addresses that process for moving from our current system with a separate licensure or registration process for housing with services and home care providers to a unified license. And that does things such as establish a blackout period shortly before August 1st, where no new licenses um, would be issued under the old system immediately before the new system comes into place and addressing situations where there might be for example, a construction project that started before August 1st, but isn't going to be complete until after August 1st. And that entity needs to have clarity about what the rules are under which they're going to be operating for physical plant um, issues. So there's a, a lot of interdependent work that needs to happen for us in order to effectively implement the licensure process starting on August 1st. So for us, passage of this language is critical to our ability to move forward because if we don't have clarity on some of these items, we cannot build the software systems, the training, the communication materials, um, et cetera, in order for us to move forward if there's still uncertainty on some of these items. It's also really critical for clients, for residents, for consumers, um, and for housing with services establishments and home care providers. They will be part of the system. They will be living with it and under it going forward. And there are going to be significant changes for them. So having a clear pathway now from the old system to the new one will help us to communicate clearly with them about these changes far enough in advance. And it's going to help them to navigate those choices that they're going to face under the new system. Um, we recognize that there may be minor technical changes that could be necessary um, to the language, but we really want to honor the consensus that we have achieved with the stakeholders and partners who are here with us today. So we would respectfully request that there are not any substantive changes or amendments um, that are added to this without agreement from the organizations who are here today and who have been signatories to the letters because to the letter because this has been a really um, a collaborative process and a, a hard won compromise. And we want to make sure that we really honor that, that spirit of collaboration that brought us here today. Um, we all do agree that said that there's more work that we need to do in 2021 to prepare for the new licensing concept. We are committed to continuing to work with stakeholders throughout the regular session in 21 and beyond if needed um, to address those other issues. But the things that are in the bill now are issues on which we all agree and which we think there is urgency to get them passed now. We have a number of subject matter experts who are here today who can answer any questions that you have about the bill, but I will end my testimony there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Diane. We appreciate that input. Uh, next, we have on the list, are there any, first of all, are there any questions 
So just raise your hand if you open up the participant at the bottom of your screen, you can raise your hand. If you can't find that, just raise your hand and Chris will see it on the screen if you have questions for MDH. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So we'll go to the next testifier. We can also take questions at the end. So the next testifier on the list is from Leading Age Minnesota, Libby Chaperin. Can you unmute yourself and proceed? Hi, everyone. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Libby Chaperin, and I'm the Director of Communications at Leading Age Minnesota. And I'm here today on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative, which is a collaboration between Leading Age Minnesota and Care Providers of Minnesota. We are pleased to support the Assisted Living Licensure Transition Bill here in front of you today, the language in front of you, as well as the BELTS language being carried by Representative Mason to help ensure that smooth, timely transition to assisted living licensure. As you all know, we were proud to support the Assisted Living Licensure and Consumer Protection Act that you all passed in 2019. You know it provided additional consumer protections and greater transparency and clarity to the regulatory oversight of assisted living. This bill in front of you today helps keep that implementation process moving forward so it happens in a timely manner as stakeholders intended, which is by August 1st, 2021. We fully acknowledge that there's still some additional work that needs to happen ahead of implementation of this law. And we remain committed to engaging in discussions throughout the rulemaking process and throughout the 2021 legislative session. Thank you for your time today. Okay, any questions for leading age? No? Okay, I'm just gonna quickly just summarize. I forgot to do this at the beginning of what's in this technical bill. Um, there's just some language that was worked on in 2019 and um, earlier this year, and um, it's prohibiting retaliation language. And then there's also um, some provisional licensure during the transition that we included in the bill. And then there's updating the minimum standards language requirements for assisted living facilities, such as requiring that staff have access to an on-call registered nurse 24 seven, requirements that facilities infectious disease protocols meet the CDC standards and better alignment um, that assisted living building requirements are aligned to Minnesota's fire code. So that's some of the highlights of what's in the technical bill. And next on the list of testifiers is Sean Burke with the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. Sean, if you wanna unmute and begin your testimony. Madam Chair and members, my name is Sean Burke. As Chair Schultz mentioned, I'm with the Minnesota Elder Justice Center, one of the consumer advocacy organizations you mentioned early, earlier in your introduction. Consumer advocates urged the passage of this bill during the upcoming special session because as you've heard, it will help the Department of Health and Providers transition to a new licensing system. The residents who live in these facilities, their families and their advocates, we've all waited a long time for these new laws that will better protect the rights and the safety of the people who live in these facilities. The pandemic has highlighted how critical consumer protections are in long-term care settings. The virus has introduced new levels of strain, anxiety, feelings of helplessness, illness, social isolation, loneliness, and unfortunately, death. We know that licensure alone will not solve all the problems in our long-term care system, but the reforms that will become operational on August 1st, 2021, will provide a new level of consumer protection never experienced by Minnesota's assisted living residents. As has already been noted, we knew back in when the act was passed in 2019 that technical and other clarifying changes would be needed to fix errors and omissions in the bill. And the bill before you today represents some of those most pressing changes, but not all. Consumer advocates look forward to working with the long-term care imperative and the Department of Health to find the right solutions to these remaining issues in the upcoming regular session. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Sean, for that testimony and thank you for your work. Any questions? So far, no. Okay, we're gonna to move to the next testifier is Suzanne Scheller with Elder Voice Family Advocates. Suzanne, if you wanna unmute and begin your testimony. Thank you so much. 
so much, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of this transition language before you today. Elder Voice Family Advocates and their members and other consumer advocacy groups have worked very diligently, as you've heard, to um, pass assisted living licensure. Elder Voice and their members are extremely concerned about protecting the elderly and vulnerable adults in long-term care facilities and have been working with legislatures and stakeholders both before COVID as well as during the pandemic. So we have uh, long advocated that assisted living licensure stay on track. And so we are supporting the transition language today with that end goal of keeping licensure on track as intended. Um, there's really three prong approach to, to the legislation. One is the licensure, the other is the rulemaking that has been referenced that's going on now that we and others are participating in feedback on. And then uh, we don't want to uh, forget the 2020 special session where we and others um, have committed to working together to try to close some of the gaps that have been exposed, particularly during the pandemic. So concerns remain and Elder Voice is looking forward to working in the 21, 20, 2021 session to try to close some of those gaps. Um, but we are communicating support of this transition language, which is essentially needed language in order to have the licensure working, but it's also some of the areas of agreement that we had had previously. And so we're, we're um, pleased that those areas of agreement are retained in the bill. Uh, and pleased that the transition language can keep licensure on track and look forward to the 21, 2021 session. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, and for all your work on this. Okay, I think that's it for testifiers. I'm gonna ask um, MDH if they wanna just do a high level overview of what's actually in the bill. So members who haven't had time to read the language, um, they can maybe ask questions after MDH provides an overview of the substance of the bill. So I don't know if Diane wants to do that or if someone else from MDH, but if you could unmute and start doing a, a brief walkthrough of the bill. Yeah, Madam Chair, this is Diane. I will uh, ask that either Mark Schultz or Lindsey Krieger provide the walkthrough. Madam Chair, Mark Schultz with the Department of Health, Health Regulation Division. Uh, the bill in front of you, the language in front of you, as been indicated, uh, does several different things uh, within the, the language. Um, some critical items, as mentioned, uh, first off, are the protections that are added into the uh, existing statutes for uh, the nursing home industry, uh, the current housing with services slash assisted living that is under the kind of current law, um, and then also for the home care statutes at the very end. Uh, that is one of the, the primary uh, first steps out of the gate. When you move through the remaining sections uh, near page two, uh, and forward, you get into the, the nitty gritty of how the technical changes uh, being requested by the department here for transition uh, are needed to help kind of solidify that information as was referenced. Uh, there was gaps in the original law and we're, we're attempting to kind of fill those over uh, to help everyone involved, consumers, providers, the department, regulators, advocacy groups all have a better understanding and more clear understanding of what it is exactly that's happening. So within uh, page two on the sections three and four, uh, you're looking at definitions of the campus idea of assisted living. When you have more than possibly one building uh, within a campus for a current provider, uh, again, a very unique concept that was easily tackled in the previous statutes and regulatory uh, process, but is different when you relook at what was drafted in 2019. Many, just for uh, members' uh, information, many of these topics too have resulted from the rulemaking process themselves. So as the department has moved through this rulemaking process, these ideas and concepts have come to the top and with the Rules Advisory Council uh, Committee that uh, many stakeholder groups are a part of, uh, they helped us craft the, these ideas into more manageable topics. And as a result, it's kind of the language that is in front of us today. Moving on to page three, uh, section five, again, it provides a definition for a license for a facility. Continuing on, uh, subdivision seven and eight 
are uh, very detailed technical terms as a result of both uh, kind of oversight in the original kind of pieces or missed um, connections, uh, and also the change in the technical law of how the rule re- rulemaking and also how the legal uh, terminology is used as uh, within the structure and the chapter itself. One of the biggest changes um, resulting from the concept of these new construction and campus settings is the license requirements under subdivision G10, uh, section nine here on the document at page uh, five. Uh, This helps uh, individuals and providers and applicants, uh, future applicants, understand that the process by which the uh, commissioner will be issuing license, uh, especially as it relates to that campus idea. And particularly if there's more than one building on a campus and one building is licensed as a, say, a dementia care uh, facility or has a secured uh, dementia element to it, how will the commissioner treat that situation for that applicant's license? Section 10 at the very top, uh, page six, is a clarification at the request of uh, several organizations uh, to make it absolutely and abundantly clear that the work being done by the Board of Executives for Long-Term Services and Supports uh, to create rules and the licensing structure for assisted living directors is a requirement for assisted living facilities in Minnesota. Um, As you uh, may have heard um, or uh, reflected upon from the HHS hearing regarding this topic. Um, That director um, licensure is really there to help create a quality among the applicants for directors. It's there to help uh, provide a standard of care and quality uh, for those entities regarding education requirements uh, uh, to be licensed and also to continue their license within the state and how that is permitted And that is why uh, we also support that inclusion of the language. Section 11 is a critical language for transitional purposes. This is reference talks about how do you, how do you deal with buildings that are currently under construction or maybe had begun construction shortly after the 2019 law. Um, And now a few years later, we have the situation of uh, guidelines, federal or state, maybe in the change process, uh, Facilities, uh, developments have fallen behind. They've gotten done sooner than others. Um, This whole section has really dealt, uh, helped to identify those issues as as many, the provider organizations and consumer organizations brought us hypotheticals of uh, what about this facility doing this at this time and how would it be treated? And this resulting language helps to cover those situations. Continuing on, with uh, section 12, uh, page 10. It's the minimum requirements for a facility uh, and licensure. Uh, This is a very uh, unique item that is thought to have been left off of the uh, 2019 information, Uh, but it is the requirement that facilities provide staff access to an on-call registered nurse 24 hours a day, seven days per week, um, as a baseline requirement um, to be implemented by those facilities then. In addition to the mention of the pandemic and the situation we have uh, within the nation and the world right now, uh, the uh, advocates on both sides requested some changes to the infection control, uh, tuberculosis prevention and control and communicable disease controls. Um, As the department has learned uh, through this, uh, its other efforts to uh, deal with the pandemic that is in front of us, um, some of these language concepts have are new uh, that just weren't here before. So we've appreciated the aspect of being able to include and, and make the infection control programming within this future license even better than what it was envisioned in originally uh, with the assistance of all those involved. Subdivision 16 or section 16, excuse me, uh, on page 13 uh, lays out, begins to lay out the physical plant requirements for fire safety. Many of these uh, comments and changes are a result of the state fire marshal um, and their expertise in the issue of how these things would be operated and implemented uh, that just again developed over the course of time with the change in state fire code, et cetera. Section 17 is design requirements. Uh, this, uh, what is contained within section 17 is called the Facility Guidelines Institute for design and construction of residential health care and support facilities. Uh, this is a, a national uh, publication that's used um, in some cases required federally 
um, and adopted by states individually to uh, provide guidance uh, for standards of how do you design a, a healthcare facility to house and, and provide services within and care for individuals. Uh, so this uh, design here actually says, provide some clarifying language that uh, the current uh, edition that will be initially used for the department would be the 2018 edition of that uh, guideline. And then paragraph B goes on to state of how the commissioner, uh, uh, this is all original 2019 law, how the commissioner will update that in the future when those future changes or adoptions by those national organizations do occur. Section 18 deals with life safety code, a very connected concept to the building code or design elements. Uh, life safety code here uh, generally is the same thing. It's a national organization that produces national standards for uh, fire and residential care, um, fire safety, health safety, evacuation safety, et cetera. Uh, that again, will be updating on a different cycle every uh, batch of years as that national organization goes out. And again, this concept of uh, listing specifically the design elements needed to get initial licensure underway is here. It provides a nice standard um, for which current uh, projects underway and also future ones that may be started before licensure, uh, what they need to uh, be responsible for. Section 19 is very uh, short, um, just identifies, makes a clarity for a technical correction about uh, contracting between entities for assist living housings or services and the provider of that service or housing. Section 20 is a very uh, small change, uh, but a very critical one for uh, consumers, especially consumers that have been uh, issued a termination notice uh, for when they want to appeal. A burden and proof is used to say who is responsible for proving the case in the jurisdiction where it's supposed to be uh, determined. In this case, there was a small change that put that burden, that onus on the consumer um, instead of uh, showing that they had to be, uh, the facility provided a, a proper notice. They just have to show that rather the termination was not permissible under the, the, the identified statutes that we have here. So a very unique, but very small and important change that we have there. Section 21 on page 17, again, is the second, or excuse me, the third reference to the life safety code. Uh, dementia care facilities or secured dementia care facilities have a uh, specific reference uh, for the care within these chapters for the life safety code. So again, we wanna make sure that we identify those accordingly and make sure that they're able to be updated appropriately on the cycle that occurs with those as well. Section 22 is the uh, third uh, consumer uh, sort of protection uh, that will be added into the 144G92 uh, that kind of states and makes a connection between the current uh, the Vulnerable Adult and Maltreatment Act in Minnesota and make sure that the rights and remedies there are not uh, superseded by anything else in this chapter. Section 23, reviser information, is just the reviser guidance instructions to help the department. Uh, as we've learned from 2019, we're still discovering cross-references that are obsolete, duplicative, or uh, currently uh, erroneous errors uh, pointing to licensure, et cetera, that need to be corrected. Uh, so we're just asking for the revisor's uh, help here to create legislation uh, for the 21 session uh, that would be able to be brought and added into any sort of final um, assist living bill as a kind of technical or carried on its own for a technical correction for the assist living licensure chapter here. And finally, uh, chapter tw or section 24 is just a simple repealer um, because of the uh, kind of reconstruction or of the state fire uh, information within the document. Uh, we no longer separately call out the requirements for dementia facilities for assisted living licensure. Uh, rather, we make a solid standard that is a very high bar for all facilities to abide by um, so that there is better protection when it comes to the state fire code in reference to any assisted living facility in the future, uh, regardless of any dementia certification or care. Uh, the repealer literally had just said that there was um, one other piece and that's been incorporated now into the new reconstruction for the section that it deals with in this chapter. And that's the overview of the bill. I'll stand for questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Schultz of MDH. We appreciate that walkthrough. Are, do any members have questions about the content of the bill? Looks like um, Representative Munson, unmute yourself, please. Yep. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Chair Schultz. Um, 
I just wanted to, to clarify a couple things on this licensure bill. And I'm sorry about the video. Um, when this bill had passed originally, or when the new uh, regulations passed, um, I heard from several facilities in my district that have um, really it's it's we call it assisted living, but it was you know apartments. There's no staff that's there. There's just you know pull chains that call nine one one basically, and uh, they don't you know they have a bus or something, or they maybe have a cafeteria that serves one meal a day, um, and that they were kind of uh, brought into this licensure rules for assisted living. And um, the concern I have just off the bat here is with requiring that there be a, a nurse on call or um, it, it seems like there's there's more and more regulations that are being added to what's really a, an apartment building that has, you know, great ADA uh, accessibility uh, for, for people in these small communities. Um, is, am I correct that, that an apartment building that offers just one service, whether it's a shuttle or a, a cafeteria is included in these regulations. Thank you, Representative Munson. And I'm gonna have MDH take that question, but my initial thought is if it's not substantial, it's housing with healthcare services. So it's not, if it's just senior living with the shuttle service, um, I, I don't believe that they're gonna be required for that nursing staff, but I'll let MDH answer your question. Okay. Madam Chair and Representative uh, Lippert, I believe it was Lippert, correct? Um, Mun Munson, but Representative Munson, Munson. apologize. Uh, <laughs> Representative Munson, there are certain requirements for licensure. Um, you have to be certain qualified. Uh, there are many agencies, DHS included, um, and the Department of Health that uh, recognize that there are certain communities and certain chapters of law that kind of have these, uh, what we call supportive services. Uh, provided in the entities. So uh, one of the changes that uh, is here today is the e expansion of the exceptions list for what types of facilities. And in this case, it talks about the uh, facilities that specifically apply for homeless shelters or other care needs of that kind of emergent nature. Uh, the intention and goal, and I believe we can uh, verify exactly, we'll have to know a few more details of the situation, uh, but the vast majority of the issue of uh, licensure and exception is very clear to exclude those types of facilities you mentioned that do not provide that kind of what everyone would consider in general terms as assisted living. Um, it, it's kind of a generic term that um, is, it's been taken you know, advantage of in, in a few ways to expand what it actually does. Uh, but when you look at the current laws on what the definition of assisted living services is and what the futures will be, uh, it's very clear then that we uh, are purposely not going as far as um, to include all those types of facilities that only do those certain things. Um, with that, there are a few uh, specific services that are uh, have been deemed uh, by all consumer groups uh, very critical to be regulated. Um, and so I would uh, maybe ask one of the other testifiers if they would like to uh, speak to that aspect of those services that have been felt uh, very critical to be licensed. Uh, but again, the department is not intending to license every single service um, that is there. It's a very comp it's a very distinct list within this statute, this chapter of law. Um, and then to answer your question about the registered nurse staffing, um, there is no uh, explicit uh, nurse staffing ratio within the current law, within this language, um, et cetera. Um, there is what is being added to this law, the requirement that assisted living facilities have to provide staff access to a registered on-call nurse uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and again, that is a different viewpoint if you have to have someone uh, physically moving with between facilities or uh, or from a business perspective of being available uh, to a facilities kind of approach. Um, and so I don't know if uh, one of the provider organizations could speak to that as well, but the concept of the access is very different than the requirement of having nursing nurse staffing ratios or having a physical uh, person in those uh, entities present. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Is there another testifier that would like to add to that answer at all? Represent Representative Munson, do you have a follow-up? Did your question get answered adequately? Madam 
Chair, if I may answer Go or ahead. at least reflect ahead, on Dan. Representative Munson's question. It, it was a very specific question related to whether the supportive services require licensure for assisted living, as I understand the question. And I will certainly defer to others for further information, but I do direct representative to 144G.08, which does define the facility as offering assisted living services. Assisted living services are very defined and they are not the same as supportive services. So the licensure, as I read it, would not require necessarily the assisted living license for transportation related services, for instance. Those are considered supportive services. So there really is a narrowing in in the statute of needing to provide an assisted living service in order to require licensure. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Scheller, for that. Okay, I think we're up to Representative Lipper, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Schultz. I have a question about the beginning of the bill, sections uh, one and two that have to do with the anti-retaliation anti language, uh, just important provisions here. Just wondering if there are any changes in this version of the bill to that language, either substantive or technical. Madam Chair and Representative Lippert, uh, this these two sections of uh, the bill itself and the third one that's later listed uh, have no changes right now. As you may um, uh, understand, there's a, a final review that kind of occurs by uh, staff at the legislature. Uh, we're in the process of kind of narrowing down the actual periods and semicolons between things, uh, but I can uh, give you my word that there is no change to those, any of those three sections on that bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Schultz. Okay, thank you, Representative Lippert. Representative Grunhagen, you're next with your question. Please proceed. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just kind of have a uh, general statement for Food for Thought. I talked to an advocate for the assisted living and they were very appreciative of, these, of many of these changes. Uh, the previous legislation was quite unworkable. Uh, for them, so they they did uh, uh, was they were very encouraged at some of these changes, and there was more to do. But at least this is a good start. Is this bill coming up in special session? No, huh? It is. So we're going to have. We hope to have four caucus agreement. This will be as part of our package in special session um, next okay. week. So we will try to pass it so we can get um, the ball rolling on implementation of the licensure for next August. So we and the department really um, have asked to get this done this month. So um, that's why it is important that all the stakeholders are supporting this. And this is consensus language of all the stakeholders. Okay. And did I, I had to step away for a little bit. What, is there any cost to this? Uh, additional costs or is this just uh, technical modifications? These are just technical language policy. There's no cost. Um, and the belts language was heard in HHS finance on Monday and that yep. has money from the SGR fund. So, um, so okay. that's why that piece was held, heard separately in the HHS finance committee informational hearing. Okay. And the other comment I have is just food for thought for everybody, but, uh, you know, I talked to the advocate from uh, from uh, assistant that you know that represents assisted living too, and really, if I heard uh, testimony right, we didn't have licensing here in the state of Minnesota. And really, I'm not a big advocate for licensing. Tell you the truth, in many cases, because I, now I am for uh, an easy access place to you know, file complaints or concerns, and then you need an enforcement group, people who will go out and check those out and do those types of things. But the problem with uh, licensing is it's, it's like a noose that you get your neck in and then people begin to tighten it, okay? Now, we may not intend that, but over a gradual period of time, that's what tends to happen. And, uh, you know, and Representative Munson already brought up the concern about do they have to have a staff person to comply? Well, 
you know, you've got like fire protection. You've got a, a fire inspector locally to check these uh, facilities out. And now we're taking a national organization who's going to uh, a one size fits all implement on all the facilities. So the concern is that when you do take this approach uh, of licensing is that you're gonna get fewer facilities, you're gonna get higher cost, and you're gonna get less access, okay? That's what results. And the trade-off isn't that you get a lot less uh, complaints or safety, but it it's all written down and people just feel good about themselves. And uh, so I, I just want people to think about that, that there's a different way to approach this if we have concerns rather than developing licensing. And uh, my, my uh, uh, you know, my experience on the school board <laughs> is that, you know, if you, and uh, this, uh, this is just an example, but if you build a new facility, all the regulations apply to that new facility, which are expensive. But if you remodel an existing facility school, they can be waived. Well, the interesting thing, this board, my, my, one of my superintendents was on the board to develop these regulations here in the state. And I think if I remember right, and it could have changed, they meet every three years. And, and the interesting thing, a lot of people on the board are architects for school construction. So I happened to be down at MSBA one time and I talked to the superintendent at that time, and this is many years ago, uh, a superintendent from uh, Woodbury on his school facilities, which he had a lot of. And I talked to him about the changes that were coming down the pipe. And I said, what is that gonna cost your, uh, your school district? Well, number one, he didn't think they were necessary. Number two, he said it was $50 million. <laughs> So you got people on these boards sometimes who actually enrich themselves financially through the implementation of these regulations. And I'm not saying this is true here, but it's one of the reasons I have a lot of concern about licensing because one day all of us are gonna be gone. Let's say we all have good intentions and there'll be a new group of people. And again, uh, you know, if we look at the history of the agencies and licensing, we see that they progressively pass more and more regulations, not less. And uh, uh, the trade-off, nine times out of 10, is fewer facilities, higher costs, and less access, and you don't get uh, much better protection. Again, anybody wants to give me pushback, that's fine. I'm just throwing it out there for food for thought, okay? because we all want to take care of the people in nursing homes and assisted living. Thank, Thank you, you Representative Gruenhagen. Thank you, Representative Gruenhagen. Um, I would like to respond to that and others may as well, but you know, we had had thousands of complaints mm -hmm. from families and people living in assisted living facilities. And we could just not, I mean, we had to do something. We're the only state that didn't license. And that was, you know, a reason others, all other states were licensing these types of facilities because they were providing services. Um, and so our job um, is to try to protect older adults and give some security to family members that their loved one was being appropriately cared for. And um, people were dying and they were not, you know, we just had some bad actors and that affected the whole industry. So I think the, you know, a lot of providers are, are going to be satisfied with licensure um, because it will address those bad actors in this industry. So, um, you know, we, we came in to correct this failure and um, I think most people um, believe that this is a positive step forward, licensing them. And it will, given what's happened, what we're learning during COVID as well, I think it will help provide additional help and services to assisted living facilities. I think it, or we're gonna see the benefits from licensure after it's um, active next year. And we didn't, we don't see in other states um, a lack of access or higher prices. That has not been the experience in other states, um, but we will track that, Representative Gr Grunhagen, and, and do some follow-up to see the impact of licensure, both yeah. hopefully the great benefits and possibly the costs. 
Yeah, Madam Chair, what would be interesting is, you know, we do these fiscal notes, which uh, some of us have a problem with anyway, but, you know, they're an estimate. But when you come with a regulation, it would be good to see an estimate of what that regulation will do cost-wise versus uh, improving uh, the benefits for the, the patients of the assisted living. And I, you know, and we want to deal with the uh, concerns and those types of things. When I bounce my similar comments off the representative from assisted living, he agreed with me. He thinks the, uh, uh, that the three consequences I spelled out uh, were true and that um, you'd be better off having stronger statutes and, litig and uh, laws in terms of consequences, easy access to file a complaint, and a group of people to check into the complaints. But anyway, I'm just throwing it out there. Just think about that, okay? Because uh, we just license one area after the next, and I don't always think it's a good idea, to tell you the truth. Okay. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank, <laughs> thank, thank you for that opinion, Representative Grunhagen. Um, Representative Very Cleveland wanted to make, a, make some statements. Go ahead, Representative Cleveland. Thank you, Chair Sheldon. Um, I would like to thank uh, Representative Grunhagen for speaking up. I think when we have diversity of thought, it challenges us to think about what we are doing. And so while I don't necessarily agree with the comments that you made, I will take them uh, with the good intent that you bring to the table and give it some thought about ways we can do our work better. So I will say thank you for speaking up and sharing your opinions. But I also um, want to thank the stakeholders who are at the table today. This has been really difficult work. I've been able to listen to many of the conversations and understand the great amount of work that the department is under at this time. And I just wanted to have an opportunity to say thank you. Um, whenever we can move forward in a positive way together to get this good work done, I think it's important to um, step back and also be appreciative of the efforts that you've all put in. So thank you for the long hours. Thank you for the difficult conversations. And I really appreciate the work that you're doing to keep our vulnerable populations and our citizens safe in this state. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Representative Cleborne. Representative Keel, you are next. So just please unmute yourself and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really appreciate the conversation. And, and I know this is, you know, I agree with uh, Representative Greenhagen and that this becomes a challenge when we regulate so much um, that we can hinder uh, opportunity for people. However, um, having dealt with uh, this for a long time, I can't even remember when we started having this conversation, um, with the news release and hearing about the backup of care of both long-term care and aging uh, assisted living and those types of things, the disgusting stories, the just disappointing treatment of our seniors and those that are vulnerable. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are ta tasked with making sure they're okay and um, I appreciate all the work that went into this. I know there was a lot of controversy, conversation about where we were at and what we needed. And, um, but, but we are charged as citizens with protecting um, vulnerable people, uh, citizens in general. And um, I, I, I'm really glad to hear that we have an agreement um, amongst the different groups. Um, you know, our, our concerns are not gonna go away, but it certainly will help us to regulate and make sure that people are being cared for. And the facilities are doing what the contract, uh, what they signed up for. So um, I think that is important. I think it's also to be said that families, when someone is, is entering assisted living or a guardian or something should be fully aware of what needs to be done um, my life experiences in the last two years have taught me to read that paperwork when you go to the hospital or um, the ER or whatever, um, read the detail of it. 
uh, I just assume they all are following rules. I've learned um, not everybody can or understands what they're supposed to be doing. And um, while we try hard to make sure um, our people are always trained, um, it becomes difficult sometimes to make sure that they understand what it is they're supposed to be doing. So uh, I think, you know, this is a great effort. Um, I'm sure there will be more conversation, right, Representative Schultz? Um, <laughs> this isn't, um, this isn't going to disappear real quick, but I think we really have to make sure that we are financially um, making sure that this is stable so that people can afford to go to dis uh, assisted living. I was rather appalled when I saw the price of assisted living and how high it had gone. And we're not even talking about the regulation yet. Um, from my in-laws, I, what, 10, 15 years ago to my parents when we looked uh, recently at it. I think my dad was going to pass out when he, first of all, I was taken to him to assisted living to look. And secondly, the price was just a little bit scary. Um, uh, but I also understand those services are important and they do cost. They're not free. And uh, it's really important that we um, make sure that everyone understands and is safe. So I probably have repeated myself way too much, but thanks a lot for the efforts that we are, you know, working toward and um, uh, look forward to having this conversation again. Thank you, Representative Keel. I just want to highlight that this really was bipartisan effort to get this passed, um, House File 90 and that I hope we can continue working in a bipartisan way because I think we all want to make sure that we're protecting older adults and making sure that they're safe and well cared for. So I want to um, thank our nonpartisan research staff, particularly Elizabeth Clarkvist, who's on the call today. Um, she has worked um, endless hours at the last minute when we asked her to <laughs> draft these bills. And I also want to note that there's some clarifying edits that are not in the draft you have. And MDH has approved these clarifying edits that were identified by our nonpartisan research staff. And we're gonna put those in a new draft and send that out. And so in the final bill that comes to special session, you'll have um, time to review the, those edits, um, but just know that that's coming and that'll be in your inbox and um, that what, what will be posted for special session. Is there any other questions before we wrap up? I don't see any. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank our partisan research staff as well for working hard. And uh, Chris McCall has been great on this committee. Um, and hopefully he'll be around next year and doing great work for, um, for our caucus. And I want to thank the GOP um, partisan staff as well for working in this issue on this area. And definitely we're going to be spending a lot more time on assisted living. Um, the rulemaking is happening um, early next year. There's going to be hearings with the administrative, administrative law judge. So we'll try to get as much information to members on this committee so they can track that pro progress of rulemaking. And if that's it, I'm going to adjourn the, the long-term care division. Thank you all for being here with us today. Have a great day and enjoy the warmer weather. Bye-bye, everybody.